from Sonar 2020. As you may know, this periodic report is a statutory requirement on NRW, and this is the second uh, of our assessments of Wales progress, of our progress as a nation towards the sustainable management of our shared environment and the delivery of our well-being goals. The report is built on hard evidence. Sonar 2020, and consistent as you may know, similar assessment report globally from the United Nations or from the Living Planet Index, and nationally from the State of Nature reports, our report makes for stark reading. We are failing in our ethical responsibilities to protect the world we share. We're damaging the resources that underpin our economy. And we're risking the health and well-being of people now and the future generations from whom we borrow the present, those who come after us. But we still do have a chance to act. We have the means, and I believe as a nation, we have the will. This afternoon, you'll hear from Minister for Environment, Leslie Griffiths, who will tell you something of the actions that the Welsh Government are taking in response to Sonar and to the combined nature, climate and indeed COVID emergencies. You'll hear from our Chief Executive, Claire Pillman, about what the report means to her and to natural resources Wales, who carried the enormous task of bringing the evidence for Sonar together. You'll also hear perspectives from the Future Generations Commissioner, Sophie Howe, from RSPB's Cymru's Julian Hughes, and from CLA Wales, Fraser McCauley. There'll be an opportunity for questions in Welsh or English from which you can use the chat function, but I need to send apologies from Sophie Howe and from Minister of Environment, Leslie Griffiths, who cannot be present for that session. The whole session is being live streamed via YouTube and is being recorded. Indeed, some of you may be watching this back and if you do have any questions, do get in touch with us at the Sonar inbox at NRW. For anyone following on social media, please use the hashtag Sonar2020. And you can see down at the bottom of your screen also that Daffith is actually building a, a visual memo of today's events. So without further ado, I'd now like to turn us to Welsh Government Minister Leslie Griffiths for her opening remarks. Hello. The success of our individual well-being, strength of our communities and success of many Welsh businesses relies upon the sustainable management of our natural resources. This is important to me and so I am grateful to Natural Resources Wales for inviting me to speak at the launch event for Sonar 2020. Through both the Environment Act and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, Welsh ministers have made a strong commitment to transformative action on achieving sustainability and taking an integrated approach to achieve the wellbeing goals. The report highlights where improvements have been made. I know change on this scale takes time, and so I recognise there is much more to do by all of us to achieve our goals. This report comes at a critical moment. Wales and the rest of the world face the twin challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss, in addition to the global COVID-19 pandemic, which has fundamentally changed our way of life. Our collective response to the pandemic represents a once in a generation opportunity to refocus our values and priorities and to realign them with those that will create a more sustainable future as set out in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. This is why I set up the Green Recovery Task and Finish Group which has already identified innovative opportunities for us to consider to continue Wales's leading role and commitment to sustainable development. Here is the opportunity amid this globally challenging time to focus our attention towards a green recovery and a society which works with nature. We have policies in place designed to take direct action to tackle climate change, manage our natural resources and improve biodiversity. SONAR will inform the Welsh Government's natural resources policy and the individual policies for each natural resource. In turn, these direct area statements across Wales guide other strategies and plans. These include the refreshed Nature Recovery Action Plan and a new circular economy strategy under development, through to our National Forest Programme and the National Peatland Action Programme. 
We need to work together as a society across Wales and further afield to transform the way we live so that the sustainable management of our natural resources can be achieved to build towards a sustainable society. Progress is already being made. For example, the collaborative place-based approach already in action through many projects across Wales, supported by Welsh Government through the RDP Sustainable Management Scheme and enabling natural resources and wellbeing fund. Sonar captures an ongoing process, providing a snapshot of where we are now and how far we still have to go. I would like to thank NRW and their partners for producing this report. Diolchenbauer. Thank you, Minister, for your time this afternoon and for sending us that message uh, underpinning the work that Welsh Government is doing now and the commitments you have going forward. I'd now like to welcome our Chief Executive, Claire Pillman, uh, who will cover some of the highlights from Sonar before she introduces the team who carried out the work. Claire, over to you. Croeso Ilanshad Sonar Duivi Lakigain. Dioch o galan i chi gyd am ddod heddiw i groesawyr a droddiad yn swyddogol, ac i ni gael cibolwg a brif a gweddau'r a droddiad. Fel mae gwenidog wedi sôn, mae Sona 2020 yn ddan mawr ac rwy'n hynod o falch i gael ei drafod gyda chi heddiw. Bydd o'n siapio'r ffoth ar adam ni, ac mae eraill, yn gweithio dros y blynyddoedd nesa, a rhaid cydnadob yr ymdrech ar lefel o'r waith sydd eu greu. Rwy'n falch o ddweud fod llawer o'r honoch am y heddiw. Felly, gen y fi a bwyd cyfoeth ga i ddweud diolch. Welcome to the launch of Sonar 2020. Thank you for being here today to welcome the report and to hear a bit about its main findings. As the Minister said, producing Sonar 2020 has been a mammoth effort and a very important one because it will shape the way we and others work over coming years. Today, we must recognise the effort and expertise that has gone into creating it. I'm pleased to say that many of you who have been involved are here today. So on behalf of the NRW board and myself, I would like to say thank you. Particular thanks must go to Helen Wilkinson, Julie Boswell and Russell Elliott and the whole Sonar 2020 team. Also to our chapter leads and assessment leads, specialists in their field, every one of them. And beyond them, the numerous contributors and reviewers across NRW and our partner organizations who have worked with us to create the report. It has been a phenomenal team effort especially during this final year when COVID made so many things difficult. Thank you, everybody. I believe that the report's quality, the evidence base and the way it has been prevent presented will make it very powerful, something that has been recognised by those who have peer reviewed our work. The Environment Act places a duty on us to publish SONAR every five years to provide an assessment of progress towards the sustainable man management of natural resources and to inform Welsh Government policy, local development plans and plans for areas of outstanding natural beauty, as well as for our national parks. It also provides a platform for us to start a conversation about the role we can all play in improving the resilience of our ecosystems so that they can continue to support our civilization for generations to come. 
the challenges that 2020 brought have made many of us pause and reflect on the way that we live and to reconnect with nature and the environment. Our economy, health and well-being depends on a healthy functioning environment which provides us with our food, clean water and the air that we breathe, the raw materials and energy for our industries. And that in essence is the challenge. The climate and nature emergencies are real and present, as is evidenced by the increased number of flood incidents we've had and species loss in Wales and across the world. The way that we are using global natural resources, burning fossil fuels and losing species rich habitats are putting our very future at risk. We need to start addressing the causes as well as the symptoms, the decline in natural resources. Building on the evidence base in the first sonar, Sonar 2020 illustrates some of the key challenges to sustainably managing natural resources in Wales. It identifies the priorities and opportunities by assessing the pressures on our natural environment and highlighting hundreds of opportunities for action across all ecosystems in Wales. Sonar 2020 recommends acting in three specific areas which put most pressure on the environment. Our food, energy and transport systems. You'll hear more about this in the conversation with the Sonar team in the next session. Taking this systems approach, Sonar suggests that action is needed across environmental, economic and social contexts. To do this, we need to engage civil society in a conversation around how we choose to live now and in the future. Sonar is an evidence base to help people across Wales a think about what can be done. We still have time to change course, but we need to act now and to do so as a nation working together. To tell us more about the report, I'll now hand over to Helen, Russell and Julie. Brilliant. Yeah, well, thank you, Claire. Um, Pranamda, good afternoon. My name is Helen Wilkinson and for this next item we're going to be holding an interview with Julie Boswell and Russell Elliott and Julie and Russell have lived and breathed the formation of Sonar for the last four years. So Julie, here we are, here's the launch. What is Sonar and what can we expect to see in the new Sonar for 2020? Thanks Helen, it's really great to be here this afternoon. Um, Sonar is our assessment of Wales's sustainable management of natural resources. So the assessments are set out at different scales with different detailed reporting at ecosystem and pressure level, right way up to an overall summary for Wales. As in uh, Sonar 2016, we started by gathering the evidence around eight broad ecosystems, including urban. This time around, we added eight cross-cutting themes to describe the dri drivers and pressures that affect SMNR for example, climate change and land use. The assessments set out our evidence around the state and trends of ecosystem services and the pressures and impacts on them. Each time we refresh the assessment, we identify the need for specific evidence that would improve our understanding of SMNR. So the revised evidence needs will be published as part of our phase two in March. We will be encouraging you to take a look to see how we can work together to meet these needs. Also new this time round, um, Sonar 2020 includes the natural resource registers. These summarise the pressures and impacts along with the opportunities for action uh, to move towards a sustainable Wales. These assessments are all carried out through the lens of the four aims of SMNR, which are also new this time around. 
Okay, you mentioned a, a number of new approaches in there, Julie. So uh, for SONAR 2020, can you tell us more about the four aims of SMNR and how they're presented? Sure, the aims of SMNR are to safeguard and enhance natural resources, to have resilient ecosystems, and also healthy places for people and a regenerative economy. The full assessments against these four aims are available on our website to download. They bring together in summary form the assessments that we have carried out across all the ecosystems and themes, as well as looking at the aims from an all Wales perspective, including Wales's impact on the world beyond our land and waters. Okay, so you also mentioned the natural resource registers. Are they new as well? Yes, they are. So these have been published ahead of the ecosystem and theme chapters, which will be available in March. The registers are organised around the eight broad ecosystems and they summarise the main pressures and impacts and the opportunities for action. But there is more to come, so keep an eye on the website, including an overseas footprint register. The interactive infographics that we've embedded into the registers section of our web report provide a different view of the registers and allow the user to explore the pressures, impacts and opportunities for action. This evidence has been used in the All Wales assessments against the AIMS. Sounds an amazing uh, package there, Julie. So um, having carried out the assessments, what are the main outcomes? What are your findings in SONAR? Well, I guess it comes as no, as no surprise that Wales isn't currently achieving sustainable management of natural resources. Sustainable management will not be achieved without action on all four of the aims. And although we have assessed them individually, it is important to note that the four aims are inextricably linked and should not be seen in isolation. Wales cannot work towards healthy places for people without resilient ecosystems, and we can't make our ecosystems resilient without safeguarding the stocks of natural resources. Without an economy which regenerates and does not negatively impact on the environment, we will always be addressing the symptoms and not the causes of the nature and climate emergencies. As the UN says, we can deal with this, but there is a lot to do. Yeah, there is. And Russell, that's a really nice lead into the responses. So how is SONAR 2020 helping to address the causes that Julie sets out there with the aims? So in SONAR, we've, we've um, set out a lot of detailed opportunities to achieve more sustainable management of natural resources in, in the eight of, each of the eight ecosystems that cover the whole of Wales, land and sea. Um, now it's everything from air and water pollution to expanding woodland cover, improving habitats for different species. And the infographics that Julie mentioned show the, the common pressures and the common opportunities across um, all of that space. And does allow us to, to start looking at some a bigger systems approach to those things. So we need action on the ground in those ecosystems, but we also could take a bigger systems approach to actually heading off some of those pressures. Yeah, so you mean, I mean, because we've got the ecosystems approach themselves, and you mean the systems approach is beyond those those broad ecosystems themselves? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the um, it's kind of the other end of the ecosystems approach, and mm -hmm. that's the um, the socioeconomic systems that are causing those those problems. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at the three biggest systems, the socio-economic systems to put pressure on the environment, we find it's the food system, the energy system and transport system. And so it makes sense that we, as well as dealing with the on the ground issues, we actually start changing those systems and scaling up and, and doing that would actually mean uh, we're taking action at scale and, and pace required to do something about nature and climate emergencies. That's quite a big task, isn't it? So how do we change those big socio-economic systems? Yeah, really, those systems, it's looking at the uh, what's referred to as leverage points. Mm -hmm. Where where in those systems can we intervene to get um, most change? And um, these are things, there's a lot of complex systems theory around this, but, but basically, um, a lot of people are saying people already know what the leverage points are, but we're often kind of 
pu pushing the levers in the wrong direction. Um, for example, with transport system, you think about making transport sustainable. Everyone thinks immediately, well, there's a lot of talk at the moment about um, electric cars, and that's that's not a sustainable solution. We can't do that. There isn't enough um, battery um, chemicals in the world to, to for everyone in the UK to have an electric fleet. So um, we're really better off standing back from the problem and taking a more of a systems approach and things like changing urban spatial planning, designing out the need for car in urban areas. Those are where you can take that leverage point and push it in a in a better direction. So it's finding those points that we can make that change. That's the that's the key. Yeah, and we mentioned the sort of the, the big aspects here and those leverage points, but and, and if you've mentioned the joined up responses here to, to change that whole system and the way we live. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's the old sustainable development thing about being yeah. social, economic and environmental aspects. And in the environment sector, we can't um, deal with these issues alone that are coming out of social economic systems, the way we live. We needs to be a response across Wales. And as soon as really there's an evidence base to inform um, local development plans, to inform budget government policy. Um, and we certainly need to work, you know, with the voluntary and private sector and um, have a, a one one um, level just have a, a conversation, um, you know, in world society about what we're going to do. We, we need we can, you know, as the UN said, and, and Julie's repeated that the UN say we can deal with connection climate emergencies, but we need to scale up and take action at the right level. It's a really key point, isn't it? Thanks, Russell. I mean, as, as Claire mentioned, I mean, creating Sonar has been that community effort involving a number of experts and staff and reviewers. And we're really grateful to those people. Um, and with their help, obviously, we want to look at uh, supporting Sonar beyond this report. It's a report for everyone to use, everyone to use in Wales. Um, the scale of response, those key messages on Sonar will also require that widespread community effort. We hope that we can build on and continue with this work with others and be able to respond to those messages and those 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 big system problems that we face. And as you say, Sonar's more more than a report, much more than a report. It's a reference for everyone and anyone, and we hope it will be a catalyst for that change. Um, thank you, Julian. So it's been really, really interesting. I think this is a nice lead into the next session. So um, on that note, I'll say thank you again to Julian Russell and hand back to Professor Steve Ormerod. Steve, you're on mute. If you can unmute, please. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, uh, Helen, Julie, and Russell, for that overview of the content of Sonar. Uh, you've told us about the evidence that's involved. You've told us also about the shared solutions that are corporately on all of our shoulders. Those solutions are around a socio-economy. They will be uh, interacting with climate, resource use and nature. And they, of course, hinge around the way we use food, energy and transport. We have control, all of us, over the way we use those resources. Can I just remind people, I can see uh, quite a lot of hands going up. Uh, if you could use the chat function to raise questions that we will uh, uh, come back a little bit later on uh, this afternoon. And if I can now turn us to uh, three short presentations from some of the partner organisations who have been involved with Sonar in various ways people who have interest in the outcomes from Sonar. And the first of those is the Future Generations Commissioner, Sophie Howe. And if I can turn to Sophie uh, to address us now. Thank you very much. For anyone who cares about the interests of future generations, the Sonar report is crucial reading. It's also in some cases quite bleak reading. We continue to see um, the journey towards extinction for a number of our species, estimations um, both at an international level and played down um, into Wales around a million species facing extinction within the next 20 years. And of course, this means um, increasing hazards, um, not just to the planet, but also to the people who live on it. We cannot survive um, without that ecological resilience. But the Sonar report also outlines a number of potential opportunities for us to take the right action to address some of these challenges. 
The report outlines the way in which we need to rethink our economy. The donut economic uh, model, which has been developed by economist Kate Rayworth and here in Wales has been um, morphed into a Wales um, sphere by Oxfam Cymru, presents a really useful way of thinking about how we work within planetary boundaries. Essentially, where we need to be is making sure that we're meeting the needs of people, but also not going beyond the resources of our planet. So critical that we look at ways of changing that. Also critical that we look at ways of doing that in a way which promotes that ecological resilience, but also helps society. And again, there are so many examples in the SONAR report um, and indeed very much aligned with my own Future Generations report, where we can see that the things that we can do can have multiple benefits. So an aspiration to have 30% of our land for nature in the UK, and in Wales that means around 400,000 hectares of land um, for nature. What could that mean in terms of the potential opportunities for jobs in the green economy? What could that mean in terms of the potential opportunities for jobs in land management? And what could that mean in terms of what we need to do now to upskill people, perhaps those who are furthest from the labour market, to take advantage of those jobs? Plans around conservation and restoration, important for our ecological resilience, important for nature, but that also helps to generate attractive and viable communities. So whether you're thinking about nature on the door, your doorstep or whether you're thinking about um, peatland restoration, that is good for local communities. We need to be finding new ways to think about how we can clean and green, restore and conserve nature in our communities. Sustainable production is a key element um, in terms of action that we need to take. And of course, Wales um, has an aspiration to become a zero waste nation. And indeed, we've been leading the world, second only to Germany in terms of our recycling um, rates. But what about um, going much beyond that in terms of fully considering um, how we use resources across the board? That has to be the aspiration for Wales and indeed is completely in line with the Future Generations Act goal of a more prosperous Wales, which talks about using our resources efficiently and proportionately. And again, thinking about reducing consumption and uh, taking action on uh, climate, uh, climate change and nature um, restoration and addressing both of those emergencies. We need to think about how we do different things um, in terms of the way that we spend. So we want to see increased spending year on year in the climate and nature emergencies. I'm really pleased to see that the Welsh Government have increased this spend um, for the last two years, but we need to see that filtering out through all of our public bodies. We also need to see some innovative solutions around food systems um, strategies, for example, connecting local food to local people and making sure that food is produced in a sustainable way. We want to think about how we can use our natural resources to produce clean energy. We need to think about what is the impact of our um, carbon intensive homes on our environment and what, could, uh, what benefits could be drawn by putting that right both to helping to meet our climate um, climate change targets. If we think about it in a way which builds in space for nature, we could do that in a way which builds in green infrastructure. By doing that, we're going to put more money in people's pockets and take people out of fuel poverty. We're going to keep people out of our National Health Service um, in the winter months because they won't be living in cold homes. And we also have the potential to regenerate communities and uh, to create new jobs. So. Whilst the SONAR report does provide some bleak reading in terms of the state of our national resources, I believe that there is an ambition here in Wales, both through the Environment Act, through the Planning Act, and significantly our internationally groundbreaking Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, to join the dots between the things that we need to do to protect our planet, to protect our natu nat um, natural resources, and to improve um, the lives of people here in Wales. Thank you, uh, Sophie, for that message. And on the one hand, reminding us just how intricately important uh, life support is to the people of Wales and, of course, beyond, but also that we do have world-leading legislation in the Environment Act, the Planning Act, and your own Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. 
Uh, just before we move on to the next presentation, can I again remind people, if you are following on uh, YouTube if, or if you are here with us, uh, if you could use the chat functions to ask any questions you may have, we will pick those up for the session. And if I could also remind people to use the hashtag uh, Sonar2020 and tag Natural Resources Wales uh, in any messages or any tweets or any other social media coverage that you are actually uh, bringing out around the launch of Sonar this afternoon. I'd like now to move us on to uh, a representative of the environmental NGO community in Wales, who of course have been part of the provision of evidence, but are also looking very closely at the evidence that emerges from Sonar. And I'd like to turn to Julian Hughes, who is Head of Species in RSBB Cymru. Julian, we are now with you. Thanks for the opportunity to say a few words at the launch of Sonar. Firstly, as I'm sure will be said by others, it's really welcome that Wales has legislation that requires this report to be produced on a regular basis. Monitoring and reporting keeps us honest, and at a time of rapid change, the commitment to do this is as important as ever. RSPB Cymru pressed for this requirement when the Environment Act was being debated in the Senedd, so we really value its production. Sonar is important to the RSPB for three reasons. Firstly, we're evidence-led and that requires good data. There's a long-used mantra that what gets measured gets managed. And if we're to manage natural resources well and tackle the intertwined climate and nature emergencies, it needs to be measured. Secondly, RSPB, NRW and a host of other organisations contribute to the state of nature monitoring. The 2019 report highlighted the continued sad decline of nature across the UK. Sonar draws on some of these same data sources and highlights the transformational changes that are necessary to reverse those declines. And thirdly, being evidence-led is only credible if it leads to change where that's necessary. As we face those two existential crises, it's critically important that in addressing climate change, we don't make the nature crisis worse. Sonar data can be really important in assessing that, not just in 2016 and 2020, but regularly in the future. So how do we hope to use Sonar 2020? We're looking forward to seeing the detail published in the spring, but it's already clear from the headlines that it contains a good deal of really valuable information. We'll be using it to highlight how nature is fundamental to our well-being. The COVID pandemic has highlighted how people take solace in nature and want to spend time in it. But we can only satisfy that need by restoring nature on a large scale. Otherwise, 60 million people put undue pressure on too few special places. The state of nature in Wales is a key test of the resilience of our ecosystems. The timing of Sonar 2020 is perfect, as this year is a crucial one for the planet. The global community will come together to set new targets for biodiversity, having largely failed to deliver on the last global deal from 2010. When we see the detail, we'll be looking hard at what it says about the most special sites in Wales, built on the foundations of the triple SIs, the sites of special scientific interest. So their condition is a key test. It's brilliant that the Minister has signed the Edinburgh Declaration by subnational governments and committed to ensuring 30% of land and sea in Wales is protected for nature by 2030. But that protection can't just be on paper those places must be in good ecological condition too. That means good management of the existing designated land and seascapes, including our AONBs and national parks, and the need to identify additional places to reach that 30%, with some appropriate covenant to achieve good management. It's critical that NRW is properly resourced to monitor these sites and to work with landowners to secure their management. And we need a suite of statutory targets to ensure the scale and pace of change is adequate over the next decade. So what do we hope will change as a result of Sonar? As I said at the start, it's really welcome that the report highlights the transformational change that's needed. Restoring and maintaining natural resources must be a key plank in the recovery from the pandemic. Sonar can highlight where we need to invest to make Wales a better place for people and nature. Working with land managers to secure carbon, water and wildlife will also sustain economic activity in the long term, measured by the state of our natural resources rather than gross domestic product. 
it feels like this is a moment to be really bold and to set Wales on a different path. Leaving the EU while posing some risks for wildlife also provides a unique opportunity, genuinely once in a lifetime, to have policies to manage land and seas well for nature, resilient to climate change, yet also that will enable northbound species to be able to move. Sonar shows once again that agriculture is the biggest driver of change for nature. So future farming policies must be effective in restoring and maintaining nature and natural resources. And in that is a plea to ensure that those policies focus on outcomes, that landowners have access to good evidence-based advice, and that the post-cap world is sufficiently flexible for land managers' own initiative and experience to be used to achieve those outcomes. Finally, Sonar throws down some challenges for us all. We must go high nature and low carbon if we're to turn the graphs around. Nature-based solutions will be a key means of addressing some of those challenges. We must deploy those in the right places and for the right reasons. Trees will be important as habitat for recreation and to capture CO2. But not if we plant them on peat soils or on the only places that threaten species such as curlews can nest. And let's remember that salt marshes and marine habitats also hold significant carbon stocks. So we need to ensure those are in good condition and resilient too. We're all, I'm sure, acutely aware that we cannot take nature for granted. Sonar shows that if we do, we risk losing it. In the last nine months, having travelled no more than 20 miles from home, I've really appreciated the cries of the kittiwakes on their clifftop colonies, the wonderful spring flowers on the limestone grassland triple SI above my village, and the song of a ring oozle on a brief foray into the Canave last summer. That should be our ambition for future generations too. So well done to the team for pulling together an immense set of information to live and work in a thriving Wales with a rich diversity of wildlife in resilient habitats, it's crucial that there is a collective response to sonar, a commitment to do more, to work smarter and to turn those graphs around. Thank you, uh, Julian, for those messages. One one pithy moment stood out in all of that for me, and, and that is that, 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 that quote, what gets measured gets managed. But of course, we have to heed the messages uh, in order to take the actions that will take us to that high nature, uh, low carbon future that I think SONA prompts us in Wales to develop. Uh, and I want to move us forward to uh, the last of our three uh, speakers in this session, in this section. Uh, Fraser Bacoli uh, represents the country landowners and business community in Wales, and he will now tell us something of this perspective that Sonar means for him as we move forward, potentially into a new agricultural future. So Fraser, we are now with you. Borada, my name is Fraser McCauley, and I'm the Senior Land Use Advisor for the Country Land and Business Association here in Wales. CLA Cymru represents many farms, but also farm diversified business, and both ourselves and our members are involved in a broad range of activities covering things like uh, planning, skills provision, connectivity, housing and tourism, as well as farming and land use. Interestingly, many of the issues that are included within the SONAR 2020 report. Firstly, I'd like to thank NRW for asking our organisation to take part in today's launch and also for the huge amount of time, effort and expertise that's gone into producing this latest edition. We really appreciate both the breadth and the detail as well as the importance of managing our natural resources sustainably. So again, thank you very much. What's been released so far has been interesting, concerning and enlightening and we're looking forward to the publication of further work in March 2021. Um, both ourselves as staff and our members have, been, have participated in the development of the report through workshops and other stakeholder meetings. And we also really encourage our members to, to really delve into the detail of the report, as well as participate in future iterations of it and the local area statements work that's um, taking place and ongoing at the moment. So as, I know, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a huge amount of information within the report. So as a rural business organisation, I'm going to focus on the section of the report covering transforming the food system. Farming and land use is key in meeting many of the wellbeing and environmental goals, and the report makes this point really, really well. I mean, farming in Wales is, is really important for many reasons, from an eco economic perspective in terms of jobs and rural incomes, 
from a social perspective in terms of the communities it, support, it supports, from an environmental perspective in terms of maintaining and improving biodiversity and mitigating climate change, and from, public, from a public perspective in terms of providing a place for enjoyment and leisure for people across Wales, which is more important um, or has been highlighted even more by COVID. While the SONAR report um, is providing the evidence and data for how things might change, the key bit of legislation on the horizon, which will actually provide the policies for addressing some of the issues raised, will be the Agriculture Wales Bill, which is currently being consulted on um, at the moment, um, and it has, all, which has also resulted from as an opportunity from leaving the Common Agri Agricultural Policy, um, which is um, as part of the European Union. Um, and that's really set um, dictated land use policy in Wales for the past 30 or 40 years. So this is a real good opportunity to shape a policy that works for um, the intricacies of Wales as a country. This uh, bill will provide the framework for farming and land use for the next 15 to 20 years at least, and is therefore inextricably linked to many aspects of the SONAR report. Welsh Government has proposed a system based on the principle of sustainable land management, which has been used to ensure the future bill will address the requirements of the Future Wellbeing of Generation and Environment Act, which is you know, really good to see. Um, the CLA have long been supportive of a system of farm support based upon the delivery of public goods and outcomes like clean water, improved biodiversity, wooden creation and management and climate change mitigation are all prominent in the SONAR report and the white paper, which is again really good to see. Um, it's, all, it's also really positive that so many actions highlighted within the SONAR report that can uh, contribute to some of the outcomes I've just mentioned are already being carried out by some of our members or can potentially be incentivized further as the new bill and policy is developed. Both the SONAR report and a new farming policy can provide opportunities for farm businesses to both demonstrate what they're doing now in terms of environmental delivery and what they can do more of in the future. So that's to demonstrate both to government and to the public who ultimately fund some of the, of the future policies. While we do have concerns at the pace of development within farming and land use policy, um, generally, as many of the environmental issues Wales faces, is time critical. Uh, we're looking forward to contributing to this work over the next weeks and months. I know one members are as well. I mean, rural businesses are businesses, and to get from where we are today to the position of managing, managing our resources sustainably, it's essential they can tra transition with clear support and guidance from Welsh Government. It's also essential supporting policies are put in place, most notably the planning system um, and planning policy to enable long-term sustainable economic development. Again, we appreciate being part of the launch and both ourselves as staff members and our, um, our, and our farming members look forward to continuing to work with NRW and Welsh Government to address the challenges the SONAR report highlights. Thanks very much. Thank you, Fraser, for that perspective and of course for reminding us that we are moving potentially into new uh, agricultural support, which could tackle at least some uh, of the challenges that we face. So now uh, we have an opportunity for you to ask us questions, to make comments on what you've seen in the presentations today uh, from the team and from our contributors. And again, if I could re remind you to use the chat function at this point, we probably have about 20, 25 minutes or so to talk through various issues. Uh, what does SONAR mean for you? What can you offer by the way of helping out what challenges can you bring to those of us who do have a degree of responsibility in helping to take things forward as a community in Wales to meet the challenge uh, which SONAR 2020 has exposed? Uh, just the, the first uh, of the questions I can see is one from Paul uh, Sinodurai. I know Paul from uh, Brecon Beacons National Park. Paul's question is around the, the, the challenge of uh, somehow trying to set aside 30% of the land in Wales for nature, for climate, for uh, appropriate ecosystem services. And Paul's question is about whether we shouldn't be thinking of better zoning of the way we use land uh, in Wales, perhaps to have food production or resource production nearer to the markets, in other words, the large settlements where those 
resources are required. Uh, Russell, this sounds to be one that's probably in your domain from an, uh, an economic uh, perspective. Would you like to try and tackle Paul's question? Um, I thought you might um, choose me, Steve. Um, let's turn my camera on. Um, yeah, I mean, an interesting one. Obviously, moving to um, integrated spatial planning, where we design these big socioeconomic systems in an integrated way, so they aren't built on, you know, relatively cheap fossil fuel use, but actually look at all elements of natural resources is is the key to, um, you know, redesigning the way we live. And um, yes, yeah, certainly, you know, there's, we've known for years about uh, food miles and, you know, flying in um, food and the, you know, the little upset around Brexit has shown the the problem when um, food doesn't come in on lorries over the channel, we're not um, um, growing our food. Um, so, yeah, a big, a big kind of spatial planning approach. And you know, one of the things we've got in Wales is the um, national development framework, putting in place um, that kind of spatial planning angle so that we can look at developing Wales in an integrated way and, and towards minimising our use of natural resources. So there's certainly yeah, all sorts of angles involved in doing that. Thank you, Russell. And again, just to remind people that we can take questions in Welsh or in English uh, if people would like to use the chat function. Uh, another one I'm seeing here from uh, Christine Hughes-Jones uh, is around an express concern that uh, we're potentially putting more and more of our environmental protection by squeezing it into limited designated sites. And perhaps uh, there are development challenges more broadly that we're not quite tackling that could help. Uh, I, I wonder if that's one, Claire, for you to give us a bit of an overview on what is the balance between broader environmental protection and resource management more widely across the environment in Wales? Are we getting it right? And perhaps Helen could add a comment on that also. I'm going to turn to Claire first. Thank you, Steve. And and thank you, Christine, for, for asking the question. Um, I think it has to be both and. Um, I mean, we welcome the, the 30 by 30 approach, but absolutely recognise that uh, it's not just designation, but condition that is important. So the condition of our protected sites is, is really critical. And, you know, we are absolutely clear that, that there's a lot of work to be done uh, there. Um, but Steve alluded to, as did did Fraser, the the um, agriculture bill, and uh, looking forward to a new um, post Brexit uh, payments system, and you know public money for public goods, and I think that that will be potentially. Uh, the thing that really makes the difference in terms of uh, connecting habitats, um, looking at landscape scale projects, so that you're not seeing uh, a sort of divide between designated sites and non-designated. I think we we need to um, we need to to see a sort of strong um environmental um uh, support for for the whole of the landscape of wales and i think that goes for the for the urban landscape as well and i think there's a lot in the report that is really powerful about looking at the way in which green infrastructure can really support communities and biodiversity so i think it is we need all of the things uh, and not just focusing on designated sites, looking at, at the wider landscape as well, looking at the payment system and looking at urban landscapes as well. 
Thank you, Claire, for that that response. I, 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 in fact, I'm going to suggest, Helen, before we come to you, we take another question because I think this might be a bit more appropriate for a double act. Uh, this is from Katie Jo Luxton at the RSPB, who is uh, asking a question which goes to the heart of one of the big issues. We, 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 we're talking about food, transport and energy. And Katie Jo's question about is about whether we don't need a more strategic approach to energy planning uh, in Wales. Katie suggests that the developer-led approach and potentially most of all in the marine environment uh, around issues with consenting could lead us to a set of circumstances where nature is being traded off. So there are two questions here. One is around our strategic approach approach to energy and the other is about the trade-off dimension that might be implied by the ecosystem services approach. So I'm going to turn to Russell first for the strategic uh, energy question and then perhaps Helen if you could pick up the issue about uh, marine and then potentially nature trading off with other aspects of environment. Russell first. Um. So, well, I guess there's a balance here, isn't there, between um, which things um, need planning, you know, need government um, and kind of statutory uh, frameworks around them, and, and then how much wiggle room you leave for the private sector to come in and actually develop energy infrastructure. And... Um, I, you know, I think I think any any of the kind of responses towards what the UN are talking about and what Sonal's talking about about big societal change and the things we've seen with COVID are there. You know, there is still a a need for um, government to provide government and the, and the statutory sector to provide a, a framework for developers. Um, and you know, the the the, the approach that we did try in the 1980s that the free market would lead to a decarbonized successful energy policy um hasn't got us where we need to go so um i mean i think it i'm, I'm not kind of currently up on detail on energy but i do know about the uh, national development framework and i kind of assume that's part of the thinking around that from Welsh government because renewables have always been um you know, wind farms, etc. Something that the Welsh government are looking at. Obviously, we've got the added dimension that the larger scale energy um, developments are dealt with at UK level. So you've all got all sorts of complications about um, who's responsible for what. In in terms of um, kind of trade off in ecosystem services, the approach we've adopted in Sonar is um, building on some of the natural capital approach, natural capital accounts that are going on, but really just treating them as useful additional indicators and not not something that you can get all your numbers on the spreadsheet and then count them off against each other because in reality they're very different um, things you're comparing apples and pears and you can't just um, deal with the environment as if it's uh, you know a set of numbers and whether you monetize it or not so um, and that's why in Sonar assessing against the four aims of SMNR we've um, Use that information and use the data and the figures, but made a made an assessment and brought expert opinion to that. So we don't we recognise getting into a situation where you've just got numbers that you're you think you can trade off is is not a, a intelligent way of dealing with um, complex ecosystems. Thanks, Russell, for that. Helen, I don't know if you have a perspective about around. The, the the balance between uh, or, or the, the place of nature in a multifunctional landscape or seascape in this case yeah it's, a, it's an interesting one and it, it is where i think from an, from an evidence perspective we are looking at those cumulative multi-benefit impacts and effects we can have and it's quite quite complex but also the spatial scale um particularly when we're looking at connectivity obviously in the terrestrial and also marine and the evidence base to support those trade-offs it is a challenge, um, particularly we've obviously got to drive in the marine for more marine renewables. The technology is moving very fast. It's hard to gather the evidence to support those decisions around whether to go with certain technologies in certain locations or not. And we like to support where we, where we can. So it's, 
it's those societal choices and then having the evidence that backs that up to, to ensure that we can ensure we do we develop nature-based solutions basically around all of the new developments that we face. Thank you, uh, Helen, for that. I, I'm going to bring Julie in for the next question, and that's from uh, Jerry. And it's a question we, we've been talking a little, little bit about about rural spaces quite a lot in the questions so far. But the question we're being asked by Jerry is on the state of urban green space and environment. How well are we balancing the needs of people and wildlife? in those urban areas where, of course, most people now have their first contact with nature. Julia, I'm going to come to you uh, with that one. Thanks, Steve. Um, we've included urban as one of our ecosystems that we're, um, we've done our assessments, which are part of the building blocks within Sonar 2020. Um, and the question is, how well have we? Um, I don't know. Do you, do you, um, do you want me to yes, chip please. in? Yes, oh, If you want to chip in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, basically, the, the urban chapter, which is, uh, we've got a summary of it. We're providing the detail in March. Um, the urban chapter is quite an interesting mix of um, half taking an approach like the other chapters, which are looking at freshwater, um, marine, woodland, and looking at the actual green space in urban areas. So we've got that covered and we're, we're you know, we're looking at parks and street trees um, and all the kind of green space issues. So we've, we've picked up um, all of that and the importance for, you know, health and well-being of that space. And then the other half of the urban chapter is, is looking at um, transport and energy and um, energy use in buildings, uh, you know, the Welsh housing stock being old. So there's kind of interesting um, dual nature to that chapter, but certainly the the green space and the well-being benefits of having nice places to live, um, recognised in there and, and cross-cutting across the report, aim three of our, our four aims for achieving a the sustainable management of natural resources. Aim three is that people have healthy places to live in, um, free of um, environmental risk, such as flooding, air pollution. So I think that's, um, you should find that that's, that's kind of adequately tied in, not only to the urban chapter, but across across the chapters as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Russell. Uh, again, there, there, there's a, a bit of dialogue going on in the chat so if people want to scroll through that some questions are being answered uh, others are being asked i'm going to turn now to a question from jonathan colchester which i find quite an interesting question uh jonathan points out that we've got fantastic backdrops behind some of us that reflect the landscapes of wales uh and but but jonathan's question is about where landscape sits uh in the four aims of the organization uh, we are the only statutory body designated to protect them. Where, where is landscape in Sonar? Russell, Julie, Claire, I don't know who's going to volunteer to put the hand up for that one. I'm happy to start off. Go on, um, Russell, you're starting as well. I'll talk about anything. Um, so, yeah, we we did, obviously, coming from, uh, I'm, I mean, I, I previously before NRW, I was part of Council Council Wales, so we had a very clear remit. Uh, about landscape and it's where I come from. Um, so in looking at achieving SMNR, we obviously had landscape in mind as well as biodiversity, um, but we've chosen to integrate it in to the, the four aims of SMNR. So the natural resources and then the, the vision ecosystems, healthy places, those are all basically um, Landscape is written across all of those. And then a regenerative economy is uh, one that you'd hope didn't impact on, on landscape. Um, so landscape in, in both senses of, you know, aesthetic cultural ecosystem services and um, the visual, visual amenity and also landscape in terms of, um, you know, the integrated look at the, the functions going on. Uh, is picked up in in all of the chapters. So each of the eight each each of the eight ecosystems um, 
look at cultural services and obviously landscape and recreation are part of that. Um, but also they do take a landscape approach. Our ecosystem approach is actually based on the principles of the European Landscape Convention um, because the two things are running hand in hand. So we, I, I'm aware over the years I have alienated either audience because you either talk about an ecosystem approach and landscape people feel left out or you talk about landscape approach and green infrastructure and then the biodiversity people feel left out. But essentially we're, we're doing both things at once. So um, we don't always use the word landscape. We sometimes talk about ecosystems, but it's an integrated setting for that place. The, the really fun, uh, fantastic question uh, fr from one of our uh, attendees, Richard Whitehead, has asked what, what, what is a really core question, I, I guess, for many people. What is different about the core findings in Sonar 2020? What difference did Sonar 2016 make to the direction and travel and progress? How much traction did it have? How much traction can we get uh, from 2020? I don't know who's going to have a go at that one. Helen, Julie, Russell, Claire. Go on, Helen. Don't mind giving it a start, but I'll hand over to others as well. I think in terms of the assessments, as, as, as Julie said, what we've presented in 2020 is, is quite different. And the assessment against the four aims is structured in a different way, particularly the natural resource registers. Um, but one of the, the, the points that Russell made quite often in terms of the pace of change here that we're finding, five years isn't a, a very long time um, to see any differences, particularly in the state of some of our natural resources. And essentially the usual sus suspects came out, similar results. I th think the 2020 is the insights around um, looking at so, so what can be done in if you like, and, and, and looking at the initial opportunities for action and particularly around that need for systems approach and um, societal and economic changes as well, which seem to come through as, as very different. It's a different fla flavour and style, I think, this time around. That's just personal thought. I Yeah, I, I think it's the, the context that's different. I think if you look at the, the key pressures on the environment, um, they're the same this time as they were last time. They're the same since um, I was at university, which is decades ago now. Um, because since World War II, we've been, um, you know, putting the same pressures on on our ecosystems on the planet. So, but the context, as Helen says, the context is different now. And we've been able to use the, the UN IPPS um, framing around nature and climate emergencies and the evidence globally that they've gathered to set our evidence in context and then suggest taking a, a kind of bigger systems approach, for instance, example, around the food, energy and transport systems to say, you know, we have got, we've, and we've gone into all the detail of all the pressures on the um, ecosystems, but how do we actually address that at scale and, and the pace that the UN is saying we need? So that's really what we've added is, is some explanation about if you want to do anything about this, why don't we try this? Um, so there's a context really that's different. Yeah, I, I think that there are several bits of context, aren't there also? So one is that we are recognising the emergencies. We are increasingly realising and COVID has, has I, I don't want to use the word helped, but has moved us more towards the position of recognising just how incredibly valuable our environment is, not only for resources, but also for well-being. But the urgency of the circumstances we are in of course, also puts a very, very different context on uh, the way Sonar 2020 will land. Uh, I'm just going to take one or two more questions before we wind up and go into breakout rooms. Uh, one question is a bit about next steps that has come in from the YouTube stream. And I'm sorry, I don't know who has asked this question, but it's about dissemination and getting the messages from the report out. The, the questioner mentions government, but of course the audience has a much broader 
than government alone. So what are we going to do this time to ensure that the communication of, of, the, of the messages from Sonor 2020 go far and wide and really bring changes? Helen, shall, um, I, shall I pick that up, I, Steve? Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was a really good question. And, you know, it's sort of what, what might the barriers be and the, the sort of challenges be in getting those messages across. And I think there's, you know, Helen and and Russell and, and Steve, you've all talked about the different context within which we're landing uh, this report and there are there are straightforwardly pluses and minuses to that different context. Um, I think you know Welsh government declared a climate emergency. They've done some some really good thinking and work around different aspects, whether it's around energy, whether it's around active travel. Um, you know, we're seeing some good things happening. Um, but, you know, we are in the minute, middle of a global pandemic and all government's energy and, and focus is rightly on that. And so I think one of the things that, that you know, is important is, is keeping climate and, and environment emergencies at the front of people's minds and making those connections between the, the pandemic, how we want to emerge from, from this extraordinary crisis, it, the work that our chair has been leading on the green recovery has really sort of started to, to tease out what we can do in Wales to ensure that actually we don't go back to where we were, we go forward. We go forward and, and develop policies that take us to a green and just recovery. And I think that it's bringing those messages together and helping people to see those connections. I also, I think, you know, we all probably spend quite a lot of time talking to, to you know, groups of people or, or individuals about um, climate and environment emergency. And one of the things that I, I find people often say is, it, it's so big, it, it's so daunting. How how do we make a difference? And I think it is that sort of breaking it into more manageable chunks and looking, as we've done in, in this version of Sonar, at the ways in which actually people can make a difference. And it's not just one person who's going to make a difference or one organisation. It's not just government. It's not just uh, environmental NGOs or environment bodies like us. It is genuinely everyone. I see Kerry has mentioned PSB partners. They're critical in getting across those messages to the, the public that they are working with all the time. But they're also critical in delivering change uh, in the way that, that, that we think about transport or the way we think about um, uh, urban landscapes. So I think it's maintaining all levels of communication, making the connections, um, focusing on the green recovery and really, I suppose, giving people that sense that actually they can make a difference and that everybody's contribution is important. Thank, thank you, Claire. I, I am uh, being reminded that we have to move on uh, into our various breakout sessions. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just going to come back uh, to you, Claire, 
just to, to take an opportunity with some closing thoughts and words, if I can do that. And I'll just say one or two things before we then split into what I think are around seven or eight breakout rooms with 20 or so people where we are ready to listen to more questions. And if I can just remind people to look through the chat uh, and see the kinds of, of, of responses and, and questions that are coming, we will try to look at all of those. And at some point, point i'm going to try and have a look at what daffy has been drawing also so claire first of all to you Lovely. for some well thank thoughts. you steve and thank you for for chairing this session and actually for all your support and leadership uh over over many months and years now um in this this area because you know Producing sonar has been just a mammoth task and involved a huge number of people within NRW and beyond. So a huge thank you to, to you and to all of them. To Russell, to Julie, to Helen for, for presenting so brilliantly today and for answering questions. And I'm sure they will follow up on all the questions that are in, in the, the chat. To, to Leslie, to the Minister, for her support. Uh, Welsh Government have been incredibly supportive of this work and we look forward to working with them over the coming years to really ensure that the evidence of sonar informs policy making, not just in environmental areas, but across the whole of Welsh Government's remit. Um, thank you to our, our, our guest speakers, to Sophie, another fabulous supporter and, and uh, a member of, of the uh, Green Recovery Task Force as well, um, to Julian um, uh, for, for our ENGO colleagues representing such a, a, a powerful and important voice uh, in, in Wales. And to Fraser, um, uh, representing just every, I suppose, just one of, of many organisations and groupings uh, representing those people who we utterly couldn't do without, the people who manage our land, manage it for nature, for food production. And I saw Geraint's comments in in thing of, of how many farmers are actually really engaged with uh, the, the, the importance of um, ecosystem resilience and uh, managing for environmental uh, good. And I think that's really powerful. Really, uh, just sort of what I am struck by is the, the weight of the evidence you know, there's no getting away from this. Um, it is really clear the scale of the challenge in front of us, but also that there are things that each and every one of us can do as organisations, as individuals that will make a difference and that that will hopefully start to see in sonars to come the impact of that on each of those ecosystems that Russell and Julie have talked about. So thank you all. And I look forward to working with everyone over coming years to, to make that difference. Thank you, thank you, Claire, and just to, to endorse all of those uh, thanks and messages. Can I suggest, uh, Adam, I don't know if you can switch us to Daffith's camera, just so that we can look at his work as I am explaining what will now happen as we move into breakout rooms. I, I'm sure, Daffith, we will find a way of uh, making more widely available the sketches that you've been uh, putting together as, as, this, as the sequence of events has unfolded this afternoon. Uh, if I can just thank Claire for your contribution also, and of course, to your leadership of, of NRW through this very important uh, journey associated with Sonar and the wider requirements that are placed on all of us as a consequence.
Uh, we are now going to be separated in to breakout rooms. As I suggested, there are about seven with probably 18 or 20 of us in each of those. Every one of those rooms will have a, a board member and also a member of the Sonar team who should be able to discuss with you and talk more about what Sonar means for all of us. So if I can just, just end this, this, this plenary session by thanking everyone who's shown their interest and given us this time this afternoon in coming along to listen and now welcome you to the breakout sessions. Uh, thank you and good afternoon to those of you I won't see again. Adam, you can now do your magic and split us into breakout rooms.